Hey everyone, this is Nicole Pascal with Topaz. Thanks so much for joining me here this afternoon. Today we're going to be talking about dramatic black and white photography. With the new black and white effects from Topaz, it is simpler than ever to use the different tools within to create really dramatic and, and eye-catching black and white. So we're going to jump into the program here in a minute and investigate the different tools that really help with the drama, turning up the drama, and uh, look at a few before and afters and go into a few different workflows that specifically center on more dramatic types of black and white or how to turn up the drama. All right, so if you have any questions along the way, you can type them into your questions module on your GoToWebinar panel. Ashley Robinson, our product manager, is going to be uh, answering those questions as quickly as she can, and then I'll answer quite a few at the end of the webinar as well. If you have any trouble with your sound or your screen, you can log off and then log back in, especially shutting down anything that might be running flash or, or taking up a lot of memory, and that will usually help with any sound or screen issues. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at a few before and afters, and then we'll go ahead and walk through one of our workflows. So this image here really utilizes the toning ability within black and white. Here's before and after. Also used a, a pretty heavy vignette and um, some adaptive exposure to really bring out some cloud details. Again, here's before and after. There we go. This image here takes into account the um, unique toning ability that black and white has. It's called quad toning. It goes a step further than the normal um, duotone type of uh, toning, and you're really able to manipulate that in a really interesting way. And I'll go into that when we go through this workflow. Here's before. Kind of a bland image at the beginning, and it was really able to make the image pop by taking it into black and white effects after. And let's see here, we'll look at this one as well. I love this image here. Here's before. Great image to start off with, um, but I wanted to see if I could really pump up the, the drama and, and the background and get, get some of those features to pop a little bit more. Took it into black and white and realized I wanted to bring back in some of that original color. I just love this red boot, so I was able to do that very quickly with uh, black and white effects using the transparency slider. So let's just go ahead and start off with this image. I'm going to get rid of, actually I'll just come up to my history and just go up to open. Now I'll just make a background copy. Make a background copy by pressing Control or Command J or dragging it down like I just did. All right, so let's open up black and white effects. Just scroll down to Topaz Labs, Topaz black and white effects. Now, if you are just joining um, on the, your first black and white webinar, this is your first time looking at uh, the black and white interface. I'll go over that real quick for you. But if you want a more advanced or more introduction type of webinar, we do have that available. This is going to be going over just a few of the different features within. But real quick, let me do a quick rundown of what we have going on. Over on the left, we have our preset panel, and that's going to contain our preset preview up at the top. As you scroll over your presets in each of your collections, the preset preview will change, giving you a little idea of, of what what it might look like. If something pops out at you and you want to apply it, you can press apply or just click on the preset and it will apply to your main image over here on the right. Below the preset preview, you have all of the different collections that we've um, categorized all of the presets that we have here for you. We have traditional collection, tone, stylized, cyanotype, albumin, Van Dyke Brown, opalotype. Um, well, you see here we have platinum and my collection as well. What you're viewing right now is a beta of our 1.1, version 1.1. Now, most of you, if you already have black and white, well, all of you, if you already have black and white effects, you only have version 1 at this point. We are working on an update like we always do here, and they are free, of course. I'm not sure of the exact day that it's coming out, but I'm hoping it'll be this week, and you should um, expect that announcement sometime in the next couple of days. So we will go out, go ahead and um, 
touch on a couple of those features here today. Since it's on here, I forgot that this was the newer version. <laughs> um, but anyways, each preset list is going, you're going to have tons of different presets to choose from. The traditional is going to be more of your silver gelatin and more traditional type of classic type of imagery, such as what you're seeing here on the right. There might be some paper tone, such as a cool tone or warm tone, but it's not going to be a significant toning within the presets themselves. We have high contrast, high contrast detailed, different high key images, low key, low contrast. We have overexposed, underexposed, and then our warm tone down here at the bottom. So lots of fun stuff just to, to go through and, and choose from with your image. In the tone collection, you're going to have all of these different realistic tones that you might find in a wet darkroom still in use today. So stuff like antique dye, sepia, selenium, gold and copper, etc., etc. So it's stylized is going to be a little bit more of a kind of out there look for some of them. Some of them aren't too bad. Um, the dynamic, we, not, we have added dynamic in version 1.1, so you can just click on that to get a little bit of an HDR pop. And then you can go as extreme as getting a very graphic type of imagery applied to your image using some of the tools over here on the right. So I don't know if you've heard, but our, um, our slogan for black and white effects is black, white, and beyond, because as you can see with this particular preset, and there's a lot of the tools that we have, we go much further than just traditional black and white processing. All right, with the cyanotype, this is going to be more blue or cyan tones simulating an actual cyanotype image, a historical process that is actually a lot of fun in the dark room because you don't actually need to be in the dark room. So again, all of these presets are just here for you to take a look at. Your albumin collection is going to be more purple to brown tones with yellowing highlights, another historical process. Uh, historical process. The Van Dyke Brown is going to be more rich brown tones. Then you have your opalotype, which is going to um, simulate the historical process of, of printing on milk or opal glass. And that is going to take the form of so many different types of, of looks. Many times opalotypes were hand tinted, so we do have the ability to bring back some of the original image color, an almost pastel-like type of color, so that's a really nice feature to have in this particular preset collection. The Platinum Collection is going to be our newest collection here for you, a historical process. It's my personal favorite historical process, but very hard to simulate. So we've been able to, to try to simulate it, and hopefully that you'll enjoy that once you have version 1.1. And then we have My Collection as well. My Collection is going to automatically um, or by default take all of your images or take all the presets that you create and put them into this collection because we have so many different collections for you, it's kind of hard to root out exactly where your preset was. So coming down here to the bottom, if you get to a point and you want to save a preset, you just say Save. You name the preset, let's just name it test, created for all of this good stuff, and we now have this little checkbox that says save in my collection. If you don't want to save it in my collection, if it's specifically a cyanotype or albumin and you want to continue to keep it there, you just uncheck this box. But if you want to save it in my collection, you check it, press OK, and you'll notice that it's going to pop up over here as we come out and we come back in test is now here for us. All right, you can delete your user-made presets, import and export so you can share with others as well. Let's go back into our traditional. Down here in the menu, you do have preferences. This is where you can enable or disable your tool tips, which will tell you exactly what kind of um, process each of these collections are and tell you all the different tools how they work. You can enable those. I have them disabled just so they don't pop up for you guys on the webinar itself. And we now have interactive sliders as well. So I'm not going to turn that on because processing that or having that come across over the webinar might not be the best idea. I haven't tried it out yet. So I'm going to keep it as um, we usually have it. But there are all of the preferences we have available for you.
In the main screen, we have our main preview, which you can go into a split screen mode by clicking up here or main. And then over here on the right, we have our preview navigator where you have all of your zoom tools. You have um, the ability to fit it within your preview, undo, redo your snap feature, which we can get into later, and then all of the different parameters and, and workflow steps here available for you. We'll go through some of these in here in just a second. If you want to reset all, you just press reset and press OK to get back into the program and cancel to cancel out of your session. So that is the basic interface. So today we're going to be talking about what tools help you to really quickly get that punch of drama that everybody looks for in black and white. And even when you have a really nice image such as this one, it, you do still need some contrast enhancements and, and toning enhancements and using the technology that black and white has we can we can get that pretty quickly instead of starting from an effect or a different preset which I'll do in the next couple of workflows I'm actually just going to jump into the heart of the program over here as a lot of you know the workflow that we set out for you is in four basic stages your conversion stage creative effects local adjustments and finishing touches so today most of our really high impact drama tools are going to be coming from the conversion and then the finishing touches so let's just go into the conversion first. When I'm taking an image in at its neutral grayscale tone like this one, I like to just start at the very top and just work my way down and add what I need to. So that's what we're going to do. Starting off with the basic exposure, you have the contrast brightness, which are just kind of normal uh, sliders here for you. But what is kind of high impact within this particular tool set is your boost blacks and boost whites. Here you're able to only affect your darker tones within your image and move it closer to black or move it farther away from black. It's only going to affect those darker tones though. The same thing with your whites. So you're able to individually enhance that without messing up other areas of your image. So it, it really starts to be kind of a high impact type of tool for you. So I am going to take my boost whites up just a little bit and get that get the background boosted up. I'm also going to take my contrast up just a little. Okay, and we're going to continue to enhance our contrast in the curve tool below. Let's see, I'm not sure what I want to do with my brightness quite yet, so I think I'll just leave it right about there. We can come back to it if need be. Now one thing within black and white effects that makes it really easy to get some drama is this adaptive exposure. If you're an adjust user, then you know that the adaptive exposure is going to give you that pop that adjust is so well known for. So one tool that you can use just to click it on and off is this little checkbox next to it, which each of these tools have it. You can just click it on. So here is the, are the default values for the adaptive exposure. Again, here's before and after. So immediately, just with the default values, you can see a, details and, and tonality differences starting to come out within the sky and the clouds behind starting to make a very nice background and all of these different tonalities within the water just popped out as well as within his clothes and in face. So let's look at that one more time. Here's before and after. So it immediately just created a punch and that's my favorite use um, or my favorite tool just to immediately get that drama I'm looking for usually within black and whites. So to increase it or change the tonality or balance it out differently or even go for a more stylized look, you can play with the adaptive exposure and region control. So as you move the adaptive exposure up, it's going to make that contrast, that localized contrast really pop a little bit more. So as you keep increasing it, you'll see that that stylized almost HDR type of effect starts to happen, especially as you start to play with your regions. So you can go to a very stylized place just with these two sliders right here. I'm going to keep my regions a little bit down. I'm going to take my adaptive exposure down. I'm not looking for a super stylized image, just something that has some drama. So let's go to about right here. Here you're able to protect your highlights and shadows. I'm not really worried about that within this image at this point. 
and I can increase my detail and detail boost just a little bit. Now, as you increase the detail and detail boost, the detail is going to increase your overall image detail. The detail boost is going to increase the very small details within your image, which with skin in this type of portrait, let's get up a little bit closer, it starts to um, give an almost noise-like effect, and, and you don't necessarily want that. So to minimize that effect, you can click on this little box, Process Details Independently. It's my other favorite tool within this panel. And it brings you back to your more realistic image. Um, it takes away that kind of grungy effect that can happen when you're using this adaptive exposure control. So even though it looks like it took away a lot of that tonality, it did not. So here's before, here's after. So I still get a really nice balancing of my tones in different localized, more localized contrast without getting a grunge effect. So here's before, here's after. And I'm actually going to pump that up even more now. Okay, so let's keep moving on. Um, the color sensitivity within black and white effects allows you to individually enhance your color tones. So let's say I wanted to affect his skin tone or the red boot here. I could change my red slider. It's probably going to affect the, the dock as well. Yes, it does. So if I want to make that just a little bit brighter, I can make his face just a little bit brighter. I can do so really easily without affecting the rest of the image. And let's say I want to take my sky down to create some more stormy cloud type of effect. I can do that just by taking this blue and going towards the negative. And if I wanted to make my ocean a bit darker, I can take that cyan down and it'll affect that sky as well. But you can see how this can easily um, be changed to create some really nice tonal differences. So here's before and here's after. That's only the color sensitivity. Here's before, here's after. All right, let's move on to our color filter. I don't think I'm going to apply the color filter in this particular image. I don't think it's needed, but I'll show it to you. Color filter is going to simulate actually using a color filter when you're taking the image. So, for example, if I put a red filter on my camera when I was taking the image, it would brighten up all the reds and darken my blues. So I can change my strength because we've already changed the color sensitivity pretty dramatically. It's taking his face and really blowing it out. but you can see the difference here. And as you move the color filter around, you can see how it applies to the image in different ways. I'm going to take it off for this particular image. And then the curve tool. Oh yes, and within 1.1 we've also added in a, a histogram within the curve tool for you to take a look at. So those of you who have black and white effects, if you're seeing this, then you know uh, that it's coming at you. Okay, so you have your curve presets, and I really enjoy the light contrast preset usually. Here's before, here's after, and again before and after. I'll go with that. It looks pretty good. So I'm going to keep working down. When we come to the creative effects workflow, I'm not going to go through any of these, but these have a little bit more of um, an artistic factor to them. You can get more graphic shapes with posterize. You can do painterly effects and, and cartoon effects with simplify. You can use diffusion, which will give your image a really nice glow, and then camera shake to uh, simulate camera shake, actual camera shake. Okay, local adjustments. Within portraits, to kind of get some really um, beautiful effects in the eyes, I really like to put detail into my eyes. However, in this particular portrait, the eyes are pretty clear from far away, and I'm pretty happy with it. So I'm just going to move on to the finishing touches. We can go back into that local adjustments here in just a bit. Well, let me just show you real quick since, since we're here. For example, let's do the color one. I'll just bring back his red boots since I like it so much. 
Okay, and another thing within version 1.1, we do have the undo, redo, and reset for each particular mask. So you're seeing new features, and this just tells you that we're here working hard when we're not, uh, <laughs> when we're not doing webinars. So color, let's go ahead and bring back his red boot, just selective color. You're going to have four different parameters for each particular adjustment type. To click on the adjustment type, you'll just see that particular menu pop up, but it'll be very similar with these four brush parameters. So you have your brush size. You can see your brush size move as you go up or down. I'm going to keep it mid-range so you can really see how easily the color can be brought back. Um, the opacity, I'm going to take all the way up or the opacity, excuse me, and then the hardness of your brush, you can see from that inner circle that comes down and goes back up. When you're at one, it's a very hard brush. When you're at zero, it's a very, very soft brush. I'm going to keep it about mid-range again. And I'm going to keep this completely edge aware at one. When you're at zero, it's non-edge aware and acts like a very normal brush, uh, such as one that you might find in Photoshop. When you're at edge aware brush, it's very... Intel it's an intelligent brush that knows exactly what it's painting on. So the trick of using or bring doing this at edge aware is keeping your crosshairs of the brush directly on what you're trying to adjust. So if I'm trying to bring back the red boot, even though my brush is bigger than the boot itself almost, as long as I keep my um, as long as I keep my crosshairs on the boot itself, it won't bring back the water that it's touching or the other parts of the boot as I go down. Now if I want to bring back in the other parts of the boots, I can do that just by, oops, and I went over the edge. Now the thing is, is once that um, crosshair goes over the edge and hits another color, it will start to bring that back and that's what just happened. Now we have this great undo brush and you can just undo that last stroke. So now we brought back his red boot. Very simple stuff. We can go over that if anybody has questions about it later. I'm going to just continue going on and working with the drama of this program. Now we do have silver and paper tone and then quad tone. Two different toning abilities. Silver and paper tone is just going to be um, simulating actual silver and paper tone. So silver is going to be the darker tones within your image, the grays, the blacks, the paper tone is going to be the whites and the lighter grays within your image. You just choose the hue. You can do individual strengths. So here we have both the silver and the paper tone on the same hue. But let's say my pa silver tone, my darker ones, were red. And my paper, which is my lighter tones, are going to be blue. You can now move that balance around to go more towards the paper tones or the silver tones, and then you can take the overall strength down to a more realistic or more stylistic type of image. I really enjoy the quad tone, and we're going to get into that, especially within the next workflow, but what it is, is you have the availability to, to take um, four different tones and apply them in different region, tonal regions within your image and you're able to really manipulate that in a very individualistic type of way. It's, you, you can get very um, unique looks and that's how most of these historical processes were created, those presets. But for now let's just do silver and paper tone and I'm actually going to go back to the default. Within each menu you'll see this little button and what that does, it's a local reset button, so you don't have to come down here and press reset all to get this whole menu to reset. You just click on here, and you're good to go. And so you see that that has now been applied over to my left, and it's back to the default. I'm just going to take my tonal strength down, take my paper tone up, silver tone down just a little, and I'm happy right about there. Here's before. Here's after, very subtle. Okay, so you have film grain. Film grain is another way to really pump up um, some effects within your image. We have some pretty large grain, and it's um, realistic grain. It's coming from actual scans that have been scanned in from grain. 
So we have all these different presets in here for you to pull down from. For portraits like this, I tend to really like very light green. So let's go one to one and see how that's applying. Okay, so we have, let's go to 50. So it's pretty hard to see, I'm sure, on you guys' screens, but here's before. Let's, let's go a little bit more, up to 400, so you can see grain at least. Here's after. I'm going to go something just a little bit, just barely there grain, so up to 50. If you want to actually go in at that point and control your grain contrast or your grain size, you can do so and create your own grain. You don't have to use these presets, but they're there for you if you like them. Okay, with that, I will go back to fit. Okay, now with the border, you're able to put a solid white or a solid black border on. I think I'm going to stay away from the border from this one, maybe. I'll just keep the border off. With the edge exposure, you're able to d burn and dodge the edges um, independently of each other, so you can just burn the top edge. But for this image, to create a little bit more drama, I'm going to actually use a vignette. The vignette menu within um, black and white effects is very similar to the one in lens effects. If you have that, you're able to actually create your own center point. So, for example, all you have to do is click the center button and you can see that your vignette will travel wherever you click it. For this image, I do want it right in the center since my subject is right in the center, so I'm just going to default everything back. and click right in the center. Okay, and now I'm going to work with it from there. You're able to actually go um, and, and put a darker vignette, more fall off, lighter vignette on there. For this image, I'm going to do a darker vignette. You can then control your vignette size. I'm going to take my transition down so you can see how the size works. You can just go up or down. The way I like to do it is take my transition all the way down and then work with it because then I can see exactly where the vignette's being placed. I can then change my transition to exactly where I want it and and work with it in a very um, work with it this way as opposed to not really seeing the transition right off. You're also able to put it into an oval or more of a square, and I'm going to go more square for this image. I'm going to continue with my size going up and get right along those edges. Take my strength down a little, and then just heighten up my, or just take my transition up for just a little bit of a, a softening of that transition, but still leave it pretty obviously a vignette. So here's before and here's after. So one of the last things within black and white effects that really make it unique for creating kind of standout images that you weren't necessarily expecting is this transparency slider. Again, original intent for this slider was to give almost that hand-tinted look that if you took pastels or if you took um, colored pencils to a silver gelatin print, that kind of look. However, you can start to really um, bring back quite quite a lot of color and it looks really beautiful at times. So for this image, as I get down to the very end, I really like it. Here's my before though, and one of the one things I love about this image are his rosy cheeks and the bright red boot. So I wanted to somehow bring that back in without doing a selective color, so bringing back in some overall color might look good. So let's just pump that up and I'm liking it so here we are you can go all the way up and all the way up is going to take or bring back 50% of your color of your overall original color here's before here's after so you don't necessarily have to go up that high but I think I'm done so we have let's go back into our program I'm just gonna press OK and it's gonna go back into Photoshop all right, so here is where our original image started. Great image, however, I really wanted to bring out 
those clouds in black and white effects and, and pump up some of the image features and, and the contrast. Black and white effects was able to do that rather quickly, very easily, and bringing back some of that original color, I think, really added to the overall effect that we were able to achieve. So those are some of the key things to remember when you're in black and white effects is that adaptive exposure to, to bring back the drama, the boost blacks and boost whites that really give you a lot of your contrast control and gives you that extra step. And then working with your different toning ability, whether it's doing the color toning that we did with the um, color sensitivity or actual silver paper tone versus quad tone. So we're going to go into a couple other images here and I'm going to show you how the quad tone works. Let's go ahead and jump on down. This image at first glance isn't necessarily all that exciting. The colors are a little bit muted. Yes, there's a nice sunset going on, but you're not really seeing any of it. And you could pump this up in a color image, but I thought, look at all these gorgeous lines and all of these different patterns. In a monochromatic image, I believe that would be pretty stand out, and I think I achieved that with this uh, ending. So let's take this original image in and see where or how we got this. Okay, so I'm just going to make a background copy. Go back into black and white effects. And one of the things that help to create really beautiful dramatic images or black and white images is the tone. You never know how important the tone is to a black, or I'm sure you do, but I know that when I first started working with black and white images, I didn't really realize that just whether it's a warm tone or a cool tone or something just as mild as that or something going a little bit more extreme with alternative processes, toning is just so important. So bringing in the, the quad tone is really unique to this program. Let's go ahead and start out with a preset for this one. For this image, all I did was I knew that I wanted to to get more of a toned image. So I went to my toned collection, looked at some of the tones I had available here, clicked on them and said, you know, well, yeah, they're starting to look good. Here we go. But I knew that I really liked the brown tones. So I wanted to check out the Van Dyke Brown collection. What I do when I get into any collection is I just pretty much start from the top and, and just work my way down. Within most, or within I guess three of them, the Van Dyke Brown, the Albumin, and the Cyanotype, the presets you'll see, such as this one, Camel, and then below it, Camel Dynamic. The Dynamic is just letting you know that um, adaptive exposure has been added. So that's the only difference between the two. The one without adaptive exposure, which is that kind of a just pop, that's going to be your more authentic simulation of an alternative process of a Van Dyke Brown. Putting that adaptive exposure in there uh, takes it a little bit um, to a more stylistic type of look, and so it really depends on what you're going after. I'm just looking for something that looks good for this particular image, so I'm just scrolling down. All right, I like the coffee quite a bit, but it's not really um, not positive. I'm not sure if that's what I use too. I like the raw umber. Okay, but I think I ended up using the umber. Um, you know, even if that's not what I used in the beginning, that's what we're going to use now. I really like that. So when you find something that you like, if it's not handling the, the, the highlights and the lowlights within your image properly, if you want to change some of, of, of that direction, but you don't necessarily, you want to still keep the same tones, it's really easy to do. All you have to do is open up your finishing touches over here, and you say, okay, oh, let's open up my quad tone. When you open up your quad tone, you have these four tones um, that you can just click on. When you click on it, a color picker will pop up for you. So if you want to actually change the tone, it's very easy to do so. But if you want to keep the tones and only move how it's being applied to the tones on your image, you can just move these sliders. So each of these color region sliders goes from 0 to 255, 0 being black and 255 being white. 
So each tone, wherever it, it is on that slider, is going to be applied to that tonal region on your image. There's going to be some natural blending that happens within the program itself. But just move stuff, start moving stuff around, and you can really see how, how it really works. So as I move this color 3 region, this lighter mid-tone around, you can see that it, it affects the image quite a bit, actually. I'm going to leave it pretty uh, close to where it was, and then work with this color 2 region slider, and that's going to be my lower mid-tones, so my darker mid-tones. So I can create a little bit more contrast just by moving these around and tightening up the, the tonal differences here. Okay, so very quickly I'm able to, to get something more unique to this particular image with its particular tone. So here's before, here's after. Being able to manipulate the tones on such a, in, in an easy way, but also in such an, an effective way is definitely something that will help you to create real drama within the black and whites that, that's unique to black and white effects. Let's go ahead and move on up to the top and just kind of change some things around. Here again, I'm going to look at my boost blacks and boost whites. I want to take my whites up. I want the sky to kind of pop up. So let's see what happens when that. So it's only affecting my whites. Okay. And now that I have my curve tool in here, again, you don't have it yet, but you will. <laughs> you can now see if there's any clipping going on within your um, whites or blacks as you are working with them. So that's nice as well. I'm going to boost my blacks just one or two and not even worry about my contrast or my brightness because I've dealt with all that within the quad tone and my boost blacks and boost whites. Then I have my adaptive exposure. Let's try to take this up just a little. There we are. Okay, so here's before. Here's after. Really crisps everything up. This actually has a little bit of that grunge style to it because we haven't processed the details independently, and I actually like that. I want to keep that. So here's before. Here's after. Works really well for architecture images. I'm not even going to worry about my color sensitivity at this point unless I wanted to change maybe the red of my overpass. I could come in here and work with that. Ooh, that ended up doing, apparently there's quite a lot of red tone within this image. <laughs> All right, so I'm not going to really worry about that right now. And I'm pretty much done. It's very simple to create a very dramatic um, dramatic image, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just black and white. It can have quite a bit of tone added in there, so I'm just going to say OK. Press before, after. I know that in the original one, I believe um, I had a, correct, I had a border and a little bit of a vignette as well, which added just a little hint more of drama in there. So um, now I'm going to open it up to questions as we go over the last workflow, that doc image, and I'm going to answer some questions as I go with, along with that image. And then if you have any other questions that I haven't answered during this time, I will uh, be happy to answer them now. All right, let's start up at the top here. Uh, Eric is set, asked if, if there's a suggested workflow listed. I'm assuming it's left top to bottom, then right top to bottom. As for the left side, Eric, there's no suggested workflow over here. These are just presets for you to play around with. So you can, if you know that you want to take this image and directly in go straight to the Opala type collection, you can definitely do that and and work on work with it however you'd like on the preset area. If you for the suggested workflow on the right though, it is top to bottom. So the first stage is conversion, so just working from top to bottom here and then working from top to bottom all the way down. And transparency being the last, silver and paper to, or toning being the first and your finishing touches. So if you follow along with that, it's a kind of natural workflow, I'd say, something that you might actually do within the dark room or within shooting, uh, working with your exposure first and working with your contrast at the beginning and then doing all the toning and stuff at the end. So it is a kind of a more natural workflow top to bottom on the right side. 
Uh, Ruby asks a good question, says when you slide the overall transparency slider to the right, why doesn't it bring back all the color instead of just in the bottom sections? I'm not sure what the bottom, oh, bottom sections. Oh, uh, Ruby, it did bring back the overall color. Um, I believe if you look at the original here, the the blue of the sky and the ocean is not really strong, so it's going to it's going to look kind of give the impression that more color is coming back in to the boot, for example, than the sky. But it is on a global scale this transparency slider. So it's an overall transparency slider, but it only brings back 50% of the overall color. So that overall saturation will only go up to 50% because it is a black and white program, and we wanted to do a hand tinted type of look as opposed to a straight color image. I think now that you have it kind of side by side, you can tell that it, it does bring back the blue, it does bring back some of that aqua in the ocean, it's just much more strong in the strong or the more saturated colors. Uh, Sylvia asks a great question, she says, which black and white preset do you use or prefer in order to dramatize the sky? Sylvia, I think it depends on what kind of dramatization you're looking for. If it's a, let's try, try to find a sky here. Sure, we'll pop this one in. This one has already been manipulated a little bit, but I can still kind of show you how we can even go further with it. <laughs> yeah, this goes pretty far already. Let's reset all. Okay, so in the stylized collection, as far as presets go, because you said presets specifically. In the stylized collection, the dynamic one and two, either smooth or, or grunge, is going to really pump up that sky immediately. It's also going to go to the rest of the image as well though, so if you're looking just for the sky, I would, um, you'd have to kind of do a, do a mask or paint that in within Photoshop or your host program just to specify the sky only. Now if you're wanting more of a blue sky to go a really dark um, gray color or almost simulate a red filter being put on when you're taking a black and white film image, you can use some infrared presets. It's not going to look great on this image. Let's get out of here and go to one where We'll try this one. We do have some infrared presets. It's going to take your blue skies really dark right away and um, kind of dramatize it that way. Let's, we have four different presets because not every one of them look good on every single image. But you can see how that darkens everything up. This really um, gives a different look to the image altogether. It goes beyond just the sky itself. It really plays with all of the different tonal um, values within your image. And you can uh, go quite far with some of these presets. If you're looking for just having those skies pop out like on the clouds before, using that adjust, uh, adjustive, adjust technology, the adaptive exposure, I kind of lost that word there for a second, sorry, <laughs> um, the adaptive exposure to really pop that local, localized contrast out in those clouds using the um, adaptive slider along with the region slider, that will be the fastest way of getting the clouds to pop. Leonard asks, a right side, top to bottom, is that true for all Topaz products? I'm guessing you mean the workflow? I, you know, as I'm thinking about it, pretty much, yes. That, that is, it, it's, tr we try to set it out in a way that is going to be pretty easy to follow. So, the top to bottom is especially true within the black and white effects, but as with all of our products, you can go from bottom to top if that's what you choose. You really don't have to stick around um, or, or stick to that particular workflow of top to bottom. But in all of our programs, yes, that is the workflow that we follow here here at Topaz at least. Uh, George has a great uh, point. He says, does the quad tone have color presets available? I think 
families of complementary and or contrasting colors would be a nice feature. George, we do have some that are specific quad tone only presets. I would like to have it have like a drop down or something within the quad tone area, but right now that's just not going to be what what's available. What we do have are all these quad tone um quad tone presets right here. Now this there's not a lot of them and most of them are this red scale type of look. So you can just click through them to see kind of what's in there and what's available for you. We also have a more colorful quad tones that actually kind of emulate an older type of photograph, older color photograph, bringing back some of the, the reds and, and cyans that some older photographs have. And then we have more silhouette type of quad tone presets for you. And that's where we've just included two blacks and two whites within the quad tones themselves. So the, there's some blending going on, but barely any blending. It's mainly just black and white. And if you find that, um, so let's say you're in a cyanotype and you're at this preset. You opened up your quad tone and you say, you know, I like these blues, but I don't necessarily like this green color. I just want to move it a little. I want to make it more, let's just say, take out some of that saturation. You can quickly come in, pick the color, change where it is on the scale, or change the actual saturation of it, and press OK. It's applied to your image, and now you can see that that is the current tone now for your color three. And then you can save this yourself, and it'll go into my collection. So there's no presets available necessarily, but it's very simple to create the look that you're after. Hey, Nick has a, a really great point. He says it's worth remembering that modern camera sensors are engineered to show more luminance noise than chroma noise, meaning that sensor noise nowadays has a more grain-like appearance more than the old style chroma noise that we used to have to contend with. Nick, that's very true, and it's the reason that in denoise, our noise reduction software, we actually have you look at the, the majority of the noise in the Luma, in the Luma channel when you're just looking at a black and white image because it's that much, it's so much easier to see the noise when you're just looking at it, a grayscale image. So it's a very good point to make if you're finding that even before you've added grain there is an extraordinary amount of um, grain-like appearance then you're most likely dealing with some image noise and you have the um, ability to to take out the um, noise first and then bring it into black and white and add a little bit more natural grain. Great point, Nick. Freddie makes a good point. He says when using the local adjustments and then when clicking undo, it tends to do something weird. Yes, Freddie, that's because currently in version one, the only undo button you have for the local adjustments is the actual overall undo up here at the top. With the version 1.1, we now have an undo, redo, and reset button for each individual mask, so for each individual adjustment. So if I wanted to um, do some dodging down here, it's going to be really obvious. <laughs> and do some dodging here, 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 here. And nothing looks good. Now I'm able to just come over here and do an undo, or if I want to redo it. So you're able to actually work with undo and redo specifically with local adjustments now. Speaking of updates, Marsha asks, how do we get them? Marsha, whenever you sign up, for, she, I see that you have signed up for the newsletter, but for those of you have, who have not, sign up for our newsletter at newsletter or at topazlabs.com slash list, and you will get an email for each update that occurs on, on programs within the Topaz suite. Now, you actually have to click on the update button within that or go to our downloads page and download the new update once you see the announcement. All you have to do is go to the downloads page and download it from there and you're good to go. Um, we also have a check for updates within the program menu button, so you can do it that way as well. But you do have to wait until, um, obviously, the update comes out. So.
Uh, John asks, is there a simple way to organize my custom presets and folders? John, I'm not sure here if you were here at the beginning, but with version 1.1, we actually have something called My Collection that's coming out. And here you will, able, you will be able to save all of your own presets, all of your user-made presets if you so choose. Now let's say I have a platinum preset that I'm working on or something that looks like a platinum preset and I want to save it in my platinum collection because it's a platinum preset I can say save I can uncheck this save in my collection and I can say save okay head on out come back in and it's now down here for me to use. Now if I want to save it in my collection as opposed to in this actual platinum collection then I would have just kept that little check checkbox checked and it would have gone into my own area. Steve asks or notes that setting a larger number for the regions and adaptive exposure will often create a halo effect with certain areas. Other than lowering the number of regions, is there a way to mitigate this happening? Yes, Steve, there is, but it's not foolproof. So if you're still finding those halos, then you're going to have to make an adjustment for, for that particular image. So for this preset, my adaptive exposure is checked. So my adaptive exposure, to create these platinum presets, the regions had to go up pretty high to kind of give that almost metallic sheen to it. So I was able to do that. Here's before, after. It's very subtle. Really gave me a lot of range in my mid-tone grays. But let's try to create some halos. And then I'll show you how to help them go away. So when your adaptive exposure is really high, it's really not the regions that's causing it necessarily, Steve. It's how high you have the adaptive exposure. One way to take the halos off um, when you have really high adaptive exposure is to take your regions down. And that's why it might seem like the regions being up is what's causing it. But it's really not. When the regions are really up and the adaptive exposure is down, so it's kind of going opposite, those two opposite ways. Now let's say, I'm going to take my details uh, back down to one. So that's not being changed at all. And then let's say I have pretty high regions, like 30-ish and somewhat high adaptive exposure. I'm still getting these uh, halos around the, the white poles, um, a little bit on the mountains here. You can see it. You can't really tell within the actual detail of the photograph, but along these edges you can sometimes see it, especially against sky, or like a tree line against the sky is when it really starts to become obvious. This little checkbox right here is what I like to use. So I click that, process details independently, and it solves usually will solve the majority of the halo issues. So here's before, really strong halos, and here's after. So that helps quite a bit. There is still a tiny bit of a halo going on um, around these poles that are going, uh, shooting up against the sky. So the only way to solve that at this point is to either take your regions down or take your adaptive exposure down. Now, the only thing that you have to give up when you click on this process details independently is the kind of grunge look that happens with this adaptive exposure. This will smooth it out, but you still have the adaptive technology going into it, into the tonal regions. I hope that helps. Freddie asks, what exactly is Posterize? Freddie, um, Posterize is to create a kind of graphic poster type of look. So in the Stylized collection, we do have some presets that use the Posterize. One of those would be, ooh, no, actually this one doesn't. This does simplify, I believe. The Graphic Dreams presets use posterize. You can see it's a very graphic type of image. It creates a poster almost. So just uh, it takes your image down to a few tones 
believe two tones through eight tones you can choose and then you can choose how much detail to put into it. So here's a six tone poster that doesn't have a lot of detail and here's a three tone poster that does have quite a bit of detail. So if we open up our creative effects we can check out the poster. We can change this around. You can go down to two, two tones so you'll see just one and two tones and then you can add in a lot of detail or make it super 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 undetailed. I like to keep it pretty detailed. You can then put in three tones or five tones. You can go all the way up to eight tones and it becomes almost very realistic with just some graphic elements included in there. Alright, thanks so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.